Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to this special class from the Thames Valley Churches of Christ on the topic of war, anxiety, and hope. We've got a lot going on right now, haven't we? Not only COVID and all the all the fallout from that that's still ongoing, and now the war situation in Ukraine. And somebody asked me and Tim and Chevy if we would speak to that. What's our spiritual perspective on the going on goings on there? It's relevant to all of us, whether you've been to the Ukraine or not. I mean, I feel very privileged that Penny and I were able to go there in 2008. We went to a conference and were welcomed with tremendously warm hospitality by the church in Kiev there. And of course, our good friends Andy and Tammy Fleming and their family are based in Ukraine, currently in Hungary as effectively refugees. So I have that personal connection. And those of us, some here may not have that. But nonetheless, we have brothers and sisters in Russia, in Ukraine and many other places who are suffering on one level or another. And we're connected to that because we have a spiritual connection to all of our brothers and sisters, as well as a concern for those who do not yet know Christ and are suffering in these places. And so we're going to share a bit today from Scripture and a few other bits and pieces I'll explain later that I hope will help us to pray meaningfully and to be able to understand uh, at least what God might be trying to achieve here. Now, by the time you watch this, some of what I'm talking about might be out of date because the situation is moving quite rapidly. So uh, give us some grace if some of that has changed. What's coming up? Well, first of all, Tim will be talking about Herod and Jesus and some insights from that. Then Chevy will be sharing some very useful scriptures based on the issue of anxiety. And then I will do some personal sharing and then a little bit of teaching about war and pacifism for those of us who might be interested in that topic. First... God has a plan. I want to remind us today that God has a plan for us and he is in control. I think for all of us, we're tempted to be anxious at this time, but if we're able to remember that God is in control and he's working out his plan, then that helps me not to be anxious about what is happening. God has a plan, and it's a great plan, and his plan leads us somewhere great. In Matthew chapter 2, we read about Herod rejecting God's plan. Chevy, would you read that verse, please? Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Here we see Herod rejecting God's plan of Jesus and the great things that God has in store. But he doesn't want what God has planned. For us, let's remember God has a great approach for us today. We're tempted to be anxious, all of us, but let's remember that God, with God's plan, we don't need be anxious, that we can be his ambassadors, and that's what God wants at the time, for us to point people to him. Remember, turning people to God is really what our goal is. Tim has reminded us that Jesus was a refugee. And what must it be like for all the refugees right now in Ukraine and around and the countries around there? What must it be like for them? Anxiety must be one of the greatest challenges they face. And so Chevy's now going to address that. For all of us, the last two years have been a very difficult time of uncertainty. We've had so much uncertainty and worry centered around COVID. So many of us have worried about um, just our own health and the health of our family members. 
health of friends, and some of us have also suffered losses. We've had people die whose funerals we couldn't go to um, because of the restrictions. There's just been so much uncertainty that we've all had to face. I know for me in 2020, it was a very difficult year because I lost three close family members. I lost my mum, my brother and my aunt. It was a really, really difficult year. And I know I'm not the only one, that there have been others amongst us who've also suffered um, in this way. And this uncertainty um, is now continuing here in 2022, just as we're coming out of um, the lockdowns that we've had. And as the virus seems to be getting more sort of less of it, becoming less of a big thing for us. Now we're facing a completely new type of uncertainty due to the, the conflict taking place in U Ukraine. And it's really causing a lot of, um, I think, anxiety for many of us. I know for me, um, I find myself feeling very anxious, especially when I've been watching the news and I can actually feel physical symptoms of anxiety and thinking, oh my goodness, what is going to happen? And things seem so unstable in the world. In terms of world peace, I don't remember a time in my life when I felt so anxious and nervous about the future and about world peace in the future. Um, I think for me, with when I feel uncertainty, it leads me to feeling anxious. And I, th I know probably most of us can relate to that. However, I have actually found some great comfort in the scriptures. It's really, really helped me not just to pray, but also to really study out the scriptures, especially on the subject of anxiety and worry and fear. And I just wanted to share some scriptures that have really helped me over the past few few weeks especially the last week since we've had the conflict erupt in Ukraine. Uh, the first one I want to share is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. And we read, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for us. In this scripture, we're encouraged to really put our anxieties, to cast them, to hand them over to Jesus, to God, because he cares for us. And I think that's something I find very comforting, just the fact that God really cares about us. He cares about me personally. He cares about you personally. He cares about the world. He cares about the people of Ukraine. He cares about world peace. And uh, I find that a really encouraging scripture. And it really motivates me when I pray to make sure that I pray in a very honest way with God, that I can tell God how nervous I am, how frightened I might be feeling or uh, worried about me feeling when I'm praying. Um, another scripture which has helped me is in Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And again, this is another very familiar passage to all of us, but something that just seems very timely to focus on right now. And here we're told, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So in this passage, we are urged not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation. We are told to do one special thing, and that is by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving to present our requests to God. So very much laying out our requests to God. And then the amazing thing is that we get a promise. I find this so encouraging that if I do this on a consistent basis, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So God will give us peace in our hearts, but also in our minds, because so often, our, I know for me, my mind can become very um, taken up with a lot of negative thoughts, fearful thoughts, thoughts that are um, just very, um, very negative. And uh, it's amazing just to be reminded in this passage that when I present my requests towards God, to God, by, by prayer and petition, that, that I will get this peace. God will give me this peace in my heart and in my mind. And I find that really encouraging. You know, God really wants us 
to cast our anxiety on him because he loves us, because he cares for us. And, you know, God doesn't want us to be anxious, but he wants us to present our requests to him by prayer and petition. God really wants us to have peace in our hearts, peace that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And God wants us to share this with the people that we know in our lives, you know, to share these scriptures with people, maybe people who aren't Christians, maybe your neighbours, your friends, work colleagues. God wants us to share these scriptures and help when people say, how are you feeling about the war? To say, well, these scriptures are actually scriptures that help me. And uh, God wants us to really share these scriptures with other people. As we go through the days and the weeks ahead, let's really remember scriptures like this. And there are so many others throughout the Bible uh, centered around the whole topic of fear, anxiety and worry. You know, let's really commit to God in prayer, the, the Christians, the brothers and sisters we have in Ukraine the people who are helping in countries like Moldova with many char working for many charities to help with the refugees. Let's commit the whole situation to God in prayer so that we can also have that peace in our hearts and our minds. Let's really cast our anxieties on God because he cares for us. Now on to some personal thoughts before I teach a bit about war and pacifism. I have found this time to be one where it's challenged me and um, revealed some things in my own heart. Let me explain. It's on the topic of generosity. Last Sunday for the Watford Church of Christ, I taught from Mark chapter 14, where the woman pours the expensive perfume on Jesus. People rebuke her, but Jesus says she's done a beautiful thing. It's wonderful. Her generosity is applauded by Jesus. I was studying that all this last week, ready for Sunday. And on Sunday morning, I was thinking, I've got the sermon prepared, it's wrapped up, it's, it's finished, I've got a bit of spare time, I will make a donation to the U Ukrainian Refugee Fund, uh, Hope Worldwide UK, and I made a donation. I then walked into the kitchen and my wife said, uh, shall we make a donation to the Ukrainian thing? I said, well, I've done that myself, you want to add some more, how much were you thinking? And she gave a figure that was, <laughs> it was 10 times what I'd given. Not once or twice, it was 10 times what I'd given. I was shocked and it challenged my heart. And then she said, you know, there's a call for people to have homes available for people to stay in. If the refugees are allowed to come to the UK, how about we offer our spare bedroom? And in my heart, of course, there was that moment of, that's the right thing to do. That's, yes, we should do that. But in my heart, there was this, we're empty nesters now. You see, our children have grown up and left home. And I don't know about if any of you are empty nesters, but you know that sense of, liberation and freedom that comes when your children have left home and we can do whatever we like in this house and we have all this extra space and we can have people relatives or friends come and stay for a day or two and leave after a day or two and the idea of someone coming to stay with us for maybe an indefinite period oh it challenged me and then i thought gosh i've just been preparing a sermon on generosity and on extravagance for jesus and here i am in my heart hesitating about how much is right to give to the appeal and whether we might allow our home to be used for refugees. It really challenged me. Now, we made the larger donation and we signed up to be hosts. And I think my heart has changed. I hope so. What's going on is challenging me to be generous, challenging me to put my faith in God for provision and not, not limit what God can do. See, it's important to remember that Jesus, my Lord and yours, was, as Tim mentioned, a refugee. He was a refugee in Egypt because of what Herod did in the first century. And then it struck me, that's why Penny has reacted to this situation differently to me. Because her father was a refugee. In the Second World War, he was living as a child in Hong Kong at the time when the Japanese attacked. They overran Hong Kong. And my father, together with his mother and his two siblings, got on one of the last uh, ships out of Hong Kong and sailed to Australia. Uh, Penny's grandfather was captured by the Japanese and spent the war, rest of the war in a prisoner of war camp, although they thought he was dead. They didn't know he was still alive. They traveled to Australia and then on to South Africa, where they lived for a year, and then on to Egypt, where they stayed several months in tents in the desert alongside the, the uh, Suez Canal, before finally getting back to England uh, around the time of the end of the war. So my grandfather, so Penny's father was a refugee and he experienced some tough times. He was a young lad in um, one of those countries, I won't mention which, he experienced racism 
and he, he and the rest of his family were treated shamefully. Now, they also experienced tremendous compassion and support as well. So it was a mixed picture. But it, that, those experiences, of course, shaped him and shaped Penny. And so when she hears about refugees, her heart is touched. There's been evidence of racism in regard to refugees, hasn't there? If you've seen that on the news, how do we react to that? Maybe it makes us be more empathetic to people. Maybe it makes us pray more for people. Uh, whatever, it, whatever our way is into connecting with the pain of the people that, are, that the people are experiencing right now in Ukraine and in the countries around, whatever takes us into that, what channel that is, whatever channel that is for us, it's important that we recognize that. My own father was bombed out in the Second World War and spent six months living with his aunt and her family. My mother's father was away for months at a time during the Second World War because of the duties he had. My mother spent much of her childhood without her father at home. And my father, also being evacuated at times, spent several years of his young childhood away from his father, who had already died, and his mother, who was staying behind to earn uh, a living. These Reflecting on these things helps me to have empathy and compassion for people. And ultimately what that does is it motivates me to pray challenges my generosity, as I shared earlier, and it motivates me to pray. What is it that will motivate you to pray and to care about people? That's my first personal thought. The second is this. I've heard it said that with all of this is going on, it's terrible, it's awful, it's appalling what's going on, but we must make sure that as disciples of Jesus, we don't get distracted. We don't get distracted from our discipleship. Now, I think this is interesting because because it's true that these things that are going on so far away aren't things we can directly influence. And therefore, we should be careful not to be overrun by all the news we're hearing. And the fear is that we'll, we will get so absorbed in all of this that we'll forget to live like Christians and actually to, to love people. That's a fair point. But I think it does need a little nuancing. So let me attempt that here as best I can. Firstly, I think it's important that we stay well enough informed about what's going on in the world to be able to pray meaningfully about it. Now, when all this news first broke, I spent two hours watching a live news feed, something I otherwise would never do. But that was helpful because it gave me a good grounding in what's going on. But it wouldn't be good, I think, at least for me, if I did that every day. It would lead me into despair. And, and believe me, there are times recently when I have felt in despair about what's going on. So don't, I say keep up with the news, but don't let it send you into a spiral of despair. Be alert to what this news is doing to your spirit. Uh, ration yourself wisely and then pray for specific situations and people. In Colossians 4 verse 12, Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Jesus Christ, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Love that picture. Epaphras wrestling in prayer for other people in a different church, in a different city, a very different place. Maybe that's a good model for us. And it's important to remember what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He says this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. See that? Praying for kings and all those in authority. He doesn't distinguish between those who are particularly nice or nasty, those who are making your life easier or harder, those who might be fighting against you and those who are defending you. Pray for the kings. Pray for the authorities. That is something we can do. And perhaps he said this, he wrote this to Timothy and the, the church in Ephesus because it was hard for them. Why would you say it unless it was difficult? Right now, it's easy for me to pray for the president of Ukraine. It's a little harder for me to pray for the president of Russia. However, they are both loved of God. And so we need to pray. So allow this dreadful situation to motivate you to pray and to have compassion and be generous the best way you can. So that's what I have to say on a personal level. Now, I'd like to share a few thoughts about war and pacifism. Now, if this isn't of interest to you, that's okay. Maybe skip this part of the video and go to the conclusion. Do get to the conclusion because I've got a few thoughts there to share. But let me now go on to talk about the biblical and historic perspective of Christendom on war and pacifism. Now, as I share some thoughts on war and pacifism, I have to be, <laughs> I have to say, it is going to be inadequate and short. But I hope it's helpful and I'm going to put some notes in the video uh, and the uh, podcast show notes so you can follow up on that if you want. 
First of all, Old Testament. Many wars in the Old Testament, right? God told his people to fight wars. They were fought in the name of God. How do we respond to that? Well, some responses to that would include this. Firstly, Israel was building a nation and had to drive out other peoples from the land given them by God in order to have the integrity to, to actually be a nation. Secondly, you've got the holiness issue of God and his people. God's people had to be separate from the world in order to fulfill their purpose of reflecting God's presence among them to the world. Israel's relationship with God as the exclusive deity had to be demonstrably different to that of the nations around them. Things not set apart to God are offensive to God, so they could not be mixed with his people. Non-Israelites were not set apart or holy, so they had to be destroyed. By the way, I'm not saying I agree with all these perspectives, but just I'm giving you some that are commonly shared. Next point. This was all taking place, these wars, within an ancient Semitic culture. It was a different and a distant time. Therefore, it's hard for us to understand, and indeed wrong of us, to judge the values of that time by the values of our own. Additionally, God meets people in the context of where they are and in their culture. As a result, if the people of Israel were not capable of integrating with non-Israelites without compromise, or the non-Israelites were not capable of integrating with the Israelites, then the orders of God to create space between the two incompatible cultures may have been the only practicable alternative if the nation of Israel was to be established and survive. And the last point here, the goal of God for God's people and all people is the peace, the wholeness of God, shalom. War was, you could say, a temporary and necessary evil to allow this to be established in the medium to long term. So that's some perspectives on war in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, well, we're called, aren't we, to be peacemakers. Now, that is one of the most startling of the teachings of Jesus uh, in all the startling things he says, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. But he does say that, doesn't he? Blessed are the peacemakers, verse 9 of chapter 5, for they will be called children of God. We're called to be peacemakers. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? Well, it certainly means at least not participating in war. I do have some suggestions for what that might mean, and I'm going to put those in the show notes. It would take too long to go through 10 practices suggested by Stassen and Gushy. Link in the show notes there of ways to be a peacemaker, but we'll have to come back to that another time. One argument um, we should consider is that maybe there's a time for everything. Perhaps in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is telling his followers to turn the other cheek. And whether is this really a command for all circumstances of violence, or does it have a place in a certain context? We need to be a little careful sometimes about not forgetting there might be a context to this. Jesus' own example was one of voluntary subjection to the administration of violence on himself, is this an example for all of us to follow in all circumstances, or was that due to his very special role? He certainly had a different role there to you or I. Jesus and his followers were living in a very revolutionary subculture, you could say at the time, and, and yet they didn't follow that trend, did they? They weren't revolutionaries. So if they didn't go with that flow, it seems to indicate that they must have consciously decided not to use violence in their desire to establish say, the kingdom and so on. And if that's the case, perhaps this indicates that we are to follow that example and not use violence. And then there's the issue of Christians and the military. Um, it is notable in the Gospels that Jesus didn't tell anyone to leave the armed forces. Wouldn't he have mentioned this if it had been significant to him? On the other hand, there is the argument that this is, a, this is an argument from silence, and an argument from silence is never a strong one. Peter was told to put away his sword in Gethsemane. Remember that? Does that indicate that Jesus is against all violence or was that a special circumstance connected with Jesus's mission to go to the cross? The comment, those who live by the sword will die by the sword, could indicate a prohibit prohibition of violence or simply be an observation of the consequences without being condemnatory. What do you think about all those thoughts? I'm to, I mean, actually, I must say, by the way, I'm not really giving a my own view on war and pacifism here are more relaying some thoughts. What about the early church? Fascinating book. You might want to get one of these. It's a big old book. Let me show you on the video. Uh, it's called A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, compiled by David Berceau. And in here, you'll find lots of good quotes about war and pacifism and many other things. And I'm going to give you one quote from Tertullian. Tertullian, writing about 200 AD, uh, said this. Now, inquiry is made about the point of whether a believer may enter into military service. The question is also asked whether those in the military may be admitted into the faith. A man cannot give his allegiance to two masters, God and Caesar. How will a Christian man participate in war? 
for the Lord has taken the sword away. It's also true that soldiers came to John the Baptist and received instructions for their conduct. It is true also that the centurion believed. Nevertheless, the Lord afterward, in disarming Peter, disarmed every soldier. So he's there reflecting on different situations in Scripture. This is a good model for you and me. Reflecting on, oh, the centurion. Hmm. What about John the Baptist? Hmm. What about Peter in the garden? Let's think about those things as we come to our own convictions about pacifism and war. But the early Christian writings are interesting. Generally speaking, there's not a lot of um, uh, instruction about this kind of thing in the early days. But as we get to the second, third centuries, we see more writing on it. Now, what about Augustine? Augustine, 300s, 400s AD. He came up with the concept of just war, a just war. What is a just war? I'll give you his six conditions for justifying the use of force. See if you would agree with these. He said war is justified if there is a just cause. In other words, it's not just a selfish reason for war. There's a just cause behind it. Secondly, it's a last resort. You've tried everything else. Nothing else will work except force. Thirdly, uh, it, the, law the war must have lawful public authority. In other words, it's not done at the whim of some despot, but there's some lawful uh, process involved in declaring the war. Fourthly, there must be a reasonable hope of victory. If there's no hope of victory, you're just going to get overwhelmed and, and killed. Uh, there's no point to that. You might as well surrender. There must be a reasonable hope of victory. Fifthly, there must be balance towards potential good. In other words, if you win the war, then there must be some good that you can see will come out of it that will reasonably balance the sacrifices and the, and the uh, destruction and the death that's caused by the war. And sixthly, the war must be prosecuted by in, in right conduct and by right means. In other words, they must be done in as humane a manner as possible. Well, that was his, uh, his, those were his conditions justifying the use of force. Are they compelling to you? You might like to look that up in more detail. It has to be said, of course, that warfare has changed a bit since the 300s and 400s AD. So does that affect how we view his justification for a just war? What about more modern times? Some of you might have heard of the G German uh, pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was alive during the Second World War and executed by the Nazis just before the war ended. He was a passionate preacher and teacher and author on the issue of loving your enemies. It was something deep in him. He preached on it, he lived it, and yet, even though that's the case, he participated on some level with the plot to assassinate Hitler. So how do you put all that together? And if you'd like to investigate that a little bit more, I'm putting a link in the show notes to some information on the life of Bonhoeffer. So you'll see that if you want to look that up yourself. Some really interesting, historically, um, yeah, historically interesting YouTube videos. So some concluding thoughts about war. There perhaps are three types of war. Are any of these justified in your opinion? The first type of war is an offensive war. It's a war of aggression. It's a war of, I want to take some territory. I want to achieve an aim that's mine. That's one type of war. A second is a defensive war, which is a deterrent kind of war. In other words, you're going to attack me. I'm going to defend myself and my borders for whatever the reason is. The third kind of war is a liberation war, which is a war against oppression. These people are being oppressed. These people are being maltreated. These are the marginalized. We are going to go and help them and liberate them. Is that justified? Are any of them justified in your mind? Are any of them legitimate for a Christian to participate in? If you want a more detailed exploration of the key texts that are used to uh, either support pacifism or a participation in war for Christians, you might like to look at this book, which I'm holding up for the video, Slavery, Sabbath, War and Women, Case Issues in Biblical Interpretation by Willard Swartley. It's not only about war, as you can see, and it's not actually about the topics in a way. It's about the way that people use the scriptures, the hermeneutics that they use. So you might find that interesting if you would like to find out more. This is complicated. Anybody who says it's simple is, is not connected with the realities. It's easy to intellectualize this issue of pacifism and war. But what would I do? What would I do if I was in the situation in Ukraine? I honestly do not know. When I watch a war film or I talk to people who have been in war, I, I am fully convinced that war is always evil, should never happen, and no one should ever participate in it. And I never will, or I can't imagine I will. That's how I feel. But, but then if tanks were rolling through Watford and Croxley Green and up my road out here, and if my children and my wife were threatened and I had the option to defend them by joining the local militia or something similar, would I do that? This is not easy to answer. 
So I'd ask us to think about it and pray about it. And maybe it's not your top priority right now. That's okay. But maybe there are some things here to reflect on. You might like to think about it more another time. What we certainly can say is that we must pray for all involved, the authorities on all sides, people on all sides, our brothers and sisters on all sides. To finish, I would like to ask you to join me in meditating uh, on Psalm 46. I'll read this for us because I think it's a wonderful psalm in thinking about some of these issues. Maybe it's a psalm you'd like to, as a family group or a location or personally in your own home, pray through and think through in, re in connection with all of this mess that's going on. Psalm 46, beginning in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A psalm well worth meditating on and praying through. Just to finish, and I say, if you want to give donations to the Ukraine crisis appeal through Hope Worldwide UK, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. Of course, this may change as the, in, fu in the future days. But whatever else happens, let's pray, trust God, and, and be generous, and pray with compassion and urgency for everybody involved in the situation. God is in it. He will reveal what he was doing. Because where, even where there is war, even where there is conflict, even where there are things beyond our ability to understand or control or change, God is able to help us with our anxieties and God is able to bring hope even into the darkest of these situations. Till the next time, take care. God bless.